Hello, welcome to this webinar with Inner Wisdom on the theme of emerging technology, particularly AI in the transport and logistics space. I'm Paul Hamblin, I'm editor of Logistics Business Magazine, and I'm joined by an expert panel of contributors to help you perhaps understand a little better this uh, vital area of growing importance uh, and to help guide your decision making in the sector. So thanks so much to Inner Wisdom for arranging the webinar and thanks to all of you for watching. I hope we'll get some valuable insight and information for you out of the next uh, 45 minutes or so. Uh, so to that, to that end, before we get into the, into the meat of the topic, um, can I just ask you, do use the chat facility, uh, which you can see in the drop down box in your control panel to ask any questions of our panel and we'll try to answer those in the course of this webinar where possible. Um, nothing else I can say? No, I think we'll begin by asking each of the panel to introduce themselves and their areas of expertise uh, briefly. So let's start with you, Robin. Thank you, Paul. Hi, I'm Robin Meehan. I'm the CTO at Inner Wisdom and one of the co-founders. And uh, so Inner Wisdom, just very briefly, we are uh, a company focused on data exploitation. So we help organisations to exploit the maximum value from their data. And principally, we perform this on using services from Amazon Web Services, AWS, uh, which of course is underpinned by Intel. Thanks, Robin. Isabel? Hi, everyone. I'm Isabel. Um, I head up business development and partnerships at a company called GPC Systems, and we are a 3D innovative software company. Thanks, Isabel. And Peter? Uh, my name is Peter Coe. I'm an industry technical specialist at Intel Corporation based here in Swindon in the UK. My role is to help customers deliver business change or transformation using Intel's technologies. Thanks, Peter. And finally, Mac. Hi, thanks, uh, Paul. My name is Sia Mac. It's Mac for short, and I am part of the IoT group at Intel, only focusing on transportation and logistics to a certain extent. Thanks, Mac. Fantastic. Okay, so let's get to the nitty gritty. And I think a good place to start is to get a sense of where we are in the industry. Um, and perhaps I can stick my oar in a bit first, if I may. Uh, as a journalist who talks to stakeholders in the TNL space uh, every day, it seems to me, my view would be that the challenges come from one, a very obvious one fuel costs, uh, labor shortages. Um, demand for greater speed, greater efficiency, greater reliability from customers. And that, of course, is all driven very much by end consumers. Um, and then, of course, we have the longer term issues of trade frictions, um, supply chain disruption issues. And of course, let's not forget the, the long term one that everyone's talking about, the push for net zero and sustainability so there's a quite a catalogue of headaches i think we can all agree um although i know we should probably call them opportunities so can, can i ask each of you um a is, is that a fair view is that wrong and then and perhaps what are you hearing from your own customers in terms of where the key challenges lie and so let me come to you first on that mac yeah sure thanks so what you realize, especially in the, in the entire logistics business today, and then starting from the pandemic, there is an immense pressure on revenue generation, immense pressure of controlling your business and your business outcomes in a very you know, uh, optimized way. So I think those challenges altogether will speed up the ideas of how do you transform your business in such a way that, so that you can not only be ready for the future, and the change of what's going to happen around all the logistics and the transportation space right because it's not only COVID, it's not only uh, you know a, a war coming it's also our buying behavior as consumers everything is in a continu continuous change how do you adapt your business model um, uh, by using technology uh, to get there so i think the the, the revenues and the business models are in, in, in increasing pressure and i think the adoption of technology in that is going to be a very key and important for for the for the near future Thanks, Max. So, Isabel? 
Yeah, thanks, Paul. So um, I think there's a couple of things that, that both you've said, Paul, and, and Mac, you've said there about optimization, the demand, the fuel costs, all of those things are impacting the change and the trend of businesses focusing on innovation, let's say, to improve and optimise their 360 supply chain. Um, so I think there are obviously things pre-pandemic that, that Mac touched on as well. There was a big focus on green, green projects, um, and optimising the business, and I think the pandemic excel, itself fast forwarded that. Um, there weren't as many people allowed on site. Um, obviously, we were in lockdowns, there were less um, people on the road. So the supply chain industry had to really start thinking about streamlining. So we're in this rapid growth um, period with um, companies and clients to really look at that optimization but also the future thinking. So Paul, you mentioned there now, we're in a situation with fuel costs. So we're now recognizing with customers that we're having to think forward a lot quicker than we ever expected. Um, and we're hoping that with technology and, and some of the things that, that Intel do alongside Robin and, and myself at GPC, um, how we can really push that innovation forward um, and adopt technology to improve your supply chains. Okay, thanks Isabel. And Peter, what would you add to that? Yes, I suppose I come from the sort of technical side of, uh, of Intel. So the conversations I'm having are probably ones we've had for many years and very much amplify what you've just said there, around increased productivity, doing more with less. But interestingly, understanding operational costs better. And here we're leading to automation. So basically using stuff, sensors at the edge to replace manual processes to try and improve that business productivity. And out of this, of course, also improve employee health and safety, but also well-being. We want to hold on to an employee now for longer if we can, um, by making it a better place to work. How can technology, therefore, actually help deliver that? Okay. Thank you, Peter. And, and last but not least, uh, Robin. Thanks, Paul. I think your your summary of the challenges or opportunities was, was a, a good and holistic one. I would agree with all that. I think the um, in terms of the sort of customer needs that we're seeing and the, the, the key areas we're working in, I think it's really around that supply chain and distribution chain uh, optimization as a broad topic. Um, and I, I think that's got sort of building on the opportunities you mentioned. That's that's got sort of two dimensions to it. So I think our customers are really super interested in understanding and improving the the um, variability in their the performance of their supply and distribution chains um, which are you know impacted by the various things you mentioned um, and uh, therefore driving that cost from that process so I suppose a variability sort of predictability point to, to, to get the end consumer whether that's B2B or B2C get to get that end consumer experience stronger and stronger um, but at the same time, dealing with emissions challenges, cost optimization challenges, and all the other challenges that you, you mentioned. So in that environment, and then one last thing I just wanted to just mention on the challenges side is I think is that the uh, the general kind of consumer, so B two C and B two B, in fact, because uh, end user expectation is constantly sort of ratcheting up, um, kind of driven by the sort of Amazon Prime style experience where uh, members of our families will expect to. Um, order something online and receive it tomorrow. And if the promise is it will be here tomorrow, they expect it here tomorrow. And that, that permeates, I think, everything in the supply and distribution chain world as well. So that predictability is extra key because the expectations are continually increasing. Okay, thanks, Robin. <laughs> you almost wonder why anybody in the industry gets up in the morning. There are so many <laughs> challenges. But I mean, the good news is, of course, um, is that technology can help solve these challenges. So let's talk about some of these techn technical solutions and what they can do. What solutions are you, are you seeing uh, that people want to invest in to meet these challenges? And uh, if I may, I'll come back to you first on this one, Robin, as our inner wisdom uh, representative. Sure, okay, so I think the area that we focus in, as I mentioned earlier on, is we're, um, we're in the business of leveraging data for, for commercial benefit essentially. So what that means in this arena is so building on the sort of data capture, which some of our other panelists will will, will uh, discuss, I'm sure, uh, we want to use this there's a huge huge volume of data and increasing I think you might have just muted Robin. And what I might do then if I can come to
let's try it. Let's come, let's come back to, to Robin, if we may. If the rest of you can all hear me, let's come to you, Mac, on this, can we? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, see, when, when we look at the logistics challenges, uh, you know, we zoom out a little bit and see, okay, where do we see the challenges end-to-end? -end? You realize that there are three pillars that we have to go and solve with technology, right? Once the manufactured goods are ready to go, they'll enter into a warehouse, right? So there are three pillars we have. We have the warehouse, we have the assets that you're moving, and the third pillar is the um, the, the, the uh, fleets, right? So you have either the trucks or a last mile delivery uh, uh, functionality there. So these three pillars are how we look at the, um, uh, the, the transformation um, of uh, logistics uh, and supply chain. So if you look at, for example, on or the warehouse, uh, you know, uh, Peter mentioned already automation, very important, right? We realized also during pandemic, people could not you know, be able to go and fully um, you know, staff a warehouse. So what do you do there with order picking robots? What do you do there with using cameras? We even talked about drones doing label scanning. So there's a lots of pieces of technology uh, automation processes for the warehouse. Right, um, and then on the asset side, there is so much, and I, you know, Isabel will tell you a lot more about how you can do this, you know, uh, in, in, a, in, a, in a real time and in a very a proper managed way. But moving your assets is also a challenge, right? There's another example of I realized, you know, people said there are there's a shortage of containers moving from shipments, right? But there's no, there there was no shortage of containers. The containers was just disturbed the whole supply of containers because you had empty containers sitting in California that's supposed to be actually in China and vice versa and things like that. So the whole supply chain was disturbed. So how do you solve this, right? We have a project called We Are 42, right? If you look at it, Project 42 online that we did with the Port of Rotterdam into uh, being able to track those containers throughout the, their journey, right? With a small system that can you know, send a, a, a location every 15 minutes to, to the cloud, right? So this is tracking your object, knowing where it is, and then you can manage it much better. So that's on the asset side, right? So on the warehouse, I was talking about automation and robots, assets, how do you track that, understand that throughout the journey? And then there's a the fleet side of things. And on the fleet side of things, you can do a lot, right? Obviously, last mile delivery, make it electric, right? Better for the environment, net zero, that's where we wanna go, for sure. However, there is a much uh, more real-time data that you can generate, right? If you generate, generate that data, you can optimize much more, much better again. And, and that, that would be things like, uh, you know, how, coach your drivers. Right? Do you have a driver coaching system, right? Do you have driver behavior systems? Do you have uh, anti-theft cameras for your truck? Uh, and how do you use analytics to pre prevent that? We have in a case in Switzerland in which we did with a postal company, delivery, parcel delivery company. And they really showcased that after six months of pilot, for the vehicles that had the smart system installed, and by the way, this is an aftermarket solution, right? This is an aftermarket implementation, not, not that the vehicle has this technology. They had a reduction of costs by 80% for their insurance claims uh, process, right? So you have this insurance claims process that you have to go through when you hit something or when you hit a, hit a you know a bike or, or someone's property. That process costs were reduced in six months by 80%, which means, millions of savings for the for this postal company in Switzerland. So, you know, these are some examples of how you can just directly impact your business and change the whole process and, you know, uh, and, and reduce the pressure of your revenue a little bit, uh, on your revenue a little bit. Uh, I hope, you know, that gives a little bit of uh, overall view. And so maybe Peter can give some more details on how that technology helps you guys um, uh, to, to get there. But those are the three pillars I was talking about, right? So warehouses, assets, and and the fleets. Fantastic, Mac. Yeah, so let's come to you next on that, Peter. What would you what would you add to that? I think really when you dig down deep on it, um, you know, trying to do more with less. So uh, one of the first approaches is we are where we are. So what can we use that we've already got? And one of the main things that people have in their estates today, whether the warehouse, whether it's actually in the lorry, whether it's in the customer or the delivery or whatever, is cameras. Cameras are just pr prolific, particularly in the UK. Um, and if you own them yourself, you're taking data off them. The, the problem is that traditionally it's been CCTV type of security use. You have somebody looking at perhaps 50 screens trying to make some, some decisions on it. And that is the bit where Intel comes in to say, right, you know, that this is never going to speed up unless you automate it. So basically taking that information, 
use AI or artificial intelligence and we'll you know, all the buzzwords you'll hear about deep learning and you know machine learning and you know, neomorphic these are all basically just different ways of taking data out of pictures out of images from cameras and cameras by the way are visual mainly but they can be sort of infrared and uh, and other types as well pressure maps for example but this data you know a picture paint, paints a thousand words you know so it's it's that richness that we're now seeing customers saying how do i use what i've got how can i add to what i've got and actually take, make business decisions out of it now there is the other end so the other end is all this data comes in and you can, you know lots of people can provide you with tremendous amount of analytics and, and isabel will go and talk about her particular uh, camera um, uh, solution um, when it comes into your system into your it uh, business um, and my friend uh, uh, Robin at the other end sort of rubs his hands at this point because this is the all new data that your business processes and your business workloads you're running today, wherever you're doing that in the cloud, on prem, on the edge, you probably never had touched before. So, you know, it's great to have the data, but how do I use it and how do I make decisions from it? How do I get it in a way that actually means that I can improve my operational efficiency? I can reduce my costs out of it. Uh, without suddenly the technology taking over as the cost driver, which nobody, of course, actually wants, not even Intel, believe it or not. We want your business to be more successful uh, using that. So I think that's it. A, a lot of the other things you have to realize is by taking a camera picture, you can now have what we call near real time or low latency type of data. So this speeds up your process. You can make decisions immediately. You don't have to wait uh, for a driver to arrive before you look at the goods. You could have a camera looking at the goods in the back of the truck knowing exactly what uh, what there is there um, before the guy arrives in your depot so you can already plan out the storage you can already plan out the loading bay for the next lorry that's going to take it away and move it somewhere else all of this is part of technology and it's just using cameras today. that is the technology available now the big question i have to answer with customers is how on earth do i go about actually implementing that delivering it actually start that process start that journey and what has been wonderful to us and i'm sure to to a lot of people but were more of a headache and a challenge to the logistics businesses with the pandemic it all changed everything went online you know lots of parcels how do i and, and so it can't be disruptive when you change but on the other hand you know we still need to to do it if we're going to have a business going forward sure thank you peter isabel the mentioning's been talked about perhaps you can talk with with some uh, expertise on this subject and anything else you want to talk about here yeah definitely thank you um so i think the one thing overall that for me that summarizes this is about creating a more proactive workflow rather than being a reactive business um which basically very in very basic terms highlights there what mac and peter were saying and one part of thing one of the way that we do that from a, a 3d business is we utilize and work with the likes of intel and inner wisdom uh, to create uh, a piece of software to help optimize um, via dimensioning. So we um, take pictures on the fly in real time and get those 3D dimensions that then can be pushed wherever you want in the business, whether that be planning for optimization reasons or as Mark alluded to about revenue. So, you know, where can we gain revenue? You know, custom, customers might be saying they're shipping uh, a pen and what turns up is a lorry. Um, you know, we live in this world where there hasn't been data and there hasn't been that transmission of transparency between um, mm -hmm. customers and clients. So um, we create a 3D solution that then provides data um, for AI reasons and predictive analysis to then plan onwards and optimize onwards where Robin and his team can, can really utilize and then feed back to the business to make sure that you know ultimately that 360 supply chain is optimized throughout um but there is obviously processes to get to that point like max said it's the pillars that you need to look at to then get that overall optimization um so that's something that that, that we provide um it's something that we've created um along with the likes of intel we utilize their 3d cameras um and, and we're consistently innovating i think robin will probably also <laughs> probably second this is technology is amazing because we're in a space now where it's so easily adopted within within businesses the pandemic has pushed that on and made that culture change a lot easier um but also obviously we can continually innovate with the likes of intel with the likes of inner wisdom 
um, we're constantly improving so that we're always proactive rather than reactive and I think we've all learned for, through the pandemic that we were all probably in a place or the transport and logistics industry was was in a place where they needed to get into that proactive mindset rather than reactive um, and, and we obviously offer solutions that improve that proactiveness consistently day to day um, so yeah I think that's that's kind of my two cents on on that part but I don't know whether Robin wants to kind of add to anything I've said there yeah well we must give Robin a chance to recap because unfortunately we lost you I think so try again Robin I don't you hear me okay yeah yeah I can that was uh technology playing on my bluetooth speaker there we go what do you take from that so um so i think yeah from just uh, focusing on the tech side for, for, for the moment for the moment i'd say uh, we're we're primarily um in inner wisdom we're primarily leveraging the data that's captured that we just heard from our other panelists so video uh, so structured and unstructured data um textual as well and it's all about leveraging that for some kind of commercial advantage in this case um understanding the variability in the supply chain and sort of distribution networks and therefore optimizing those on. Um, I think uh, something that's something I didn't mention actually earlier, but I think a really key thing is that we're, we're in a world at the moment where a lot of these supply chain um, su supply chains are very kind of demand constrained rather than sort of uh, demand driven. So it's very much a sort of supply restriction. So it's really actually it's a, for some of our customers, it's really kind of flipped it around in terms of um, how do I how do I get the, the kind of best delivery of goods to my endpoint, be it B2B or B2C, um, given that I've got less goods than I want to ship, right? Um, which is a change. That, so that's that's a great example of how they, these supply chains need to be so sort of reactive, um, exactly as just been described, to sort of deal with very rapidly changing scenarios of where the constraints are. So, so from a technology point of view, um, as I mentioned earlier on, our, our sort of standard platform of choices, we use Amazon Web Services for the data processing. So we're processing very high volumes of data some of this is very fast, very high velocity data, especially so very high volume in terms of um, video and images, for example. And so we need really strong, robust data processing platforms. And um, we use the Amazon Web Services services for that, um, which is underpinned by Intel, of course. And um, that allows us to ingest data and process it and then run machine learning, so predictive analytics models on those, um, either in a batch mode or in, in real time. So in the technology sense, this is the, the class of services from Amazon that we use for the machine learning side is a bunch of services in the SageMaker family. So that's our kind of go-to um, weapon of choice, both for, for real-time and for batch handling uh, and making predictions uh, against that data. Okay, fantastic. Well, we've heard a lot of, you know, great talk there, but I think our attendees would want to know, you know, let's, let's talk about walking the walk now. And so I think real life case studies can make a real, impact in this area they'd love to they'd love to know uh, some great examples of where this has worked for you with some concrete uh, concrete his historical stories as it were so i mean can i come to you first isabel have you got can you sort of summarize in case study form for us for, for sort of two or three minutes um a, a business case that you've had yeah so I'll, I'll use two different ones if you don't mind paul i'll, I'll kind of touch on two Go different ahead. variations and link them back to, to earlier in the in the in the session so I think one thing that we have looked at and discussed in all of these trends um, is about optimization. So one of the things that we found with implementing our 3D dimensioning technology, uh, large uh, air cargo based company in Heathrow, uh, not, can't name any names, unfortunately, in, in, in a public forum, but a very large um, air cargo company based in Heathrow. Um, now, by just taking on our, our optimization software systems alone, um, they were about able to improve their planning by 40%. So because on the, on the point of acceptance, so when they're receiving goods and they can instantly take photos and get the three dimensions instantly and then push that, push that back to their team, their planning is improved so much that, that they therefore can load their aeroplanes more efficiently. Because once you miss an aeroplane, it's not coming back. So there's one thing that touches on the, the optimization piece. Another thing that um, I noted Peter mentioned about health and safety, um, employee well-being, employee and health and safety is very important. It's very prevalent nowadays than it ever has been before. Um, we work with a large, uh, what is called an LTL uh, company based in the US. Um, we call it slightly different in the UK, uh, but in the US it's classed as an LTL business. Um, 
they utilized our software um, and implemented the 3D technology um, and found that actually they halved the time it took to ma from manual measure to instant 3D dimensioning. So the fact that you're halving the time, it also meant that we were halving the en energy in kilohertz that was being expended. And there are actually legalities around, around health, health and safety about how much uh, kilohertz of energy you are exerting per shift um, and I think now more than ever everyone is thinking about their health and their well-being um, and it just shows how 3D technology, AI, not only can that impact revenue and it can impact business goals and business um, plans for the future but it can also help your employees, it can help your staff, it's not about eliminating employees from the warehouse so I think we fear that AI and new innovation is is replacing people um, and it's not it's actually just aiding them it's about making their well-being just as important as the business business goals and future aims thank you thank you for that isabel um, mac can you give can you give us some some examples of case studies from intel uh, yeah, sure. So let me start with the uh, warehouse. So we had a warehouse uh, project. This was uh, with uh, in China uh, with one of our partners called Forward X Robotics. And we had an issue which we wanted to make sure that order picking was done automatically without changing anything on the infrastructure. Right? The guys told us, hey, I can't stop my business. You can come and implement the technology, but I cannot stop my business. How do you do this? All right. Uh, we have uh, working. We have been working with Forward X Robotics to have smart robot systems for order picking on wheels that can basically act like a human right so they just go to the to the order pick it up bring it back and then humans can further process that that uh in, in, in the warehouse so that's a key example because you hear this a lot of times i can't stop my business right if i have to implement something new it should be done with the existing infrastructure another example was uh, in india with it with one of the biggest uh, customers there on the uh, um video analytics in the warehouse on multiple ways what they wanted to do for example was one to check if the order that was being put into the box whether that was the correct order right so you didn't do the you know put in the wrong uh, goods in, into the box so there was a camera looking down whether the the right things like you have in retail right you have frictionless shopping more or less similar kind of a use case but they also wanted it for safety people smoking cigarettes in areas where they shouldn't it's danger for for, for fire those kind of things. So there were lots of analytical analytical tools that they wanted to use to understand the environment within the warehouse. Now the key thing here was they again did not want to invest too much into the change of the infrastructure, and that's key because you know again you you want to make sure it's scalable. And we showed them how right because they already had cameras. They already had cameras from different angles. The view that looking at the cameras should have been changed, but the cameras could stay. The important thing here was was to change the edge compute. So. We told them you don't have to change all your cameras, maybe a few here and there in angles, but what we could do is just bring an edge server, right? And that's a key thing, right? With Intel, so that everything you had in 2015 in terms of power in the server can now actually be run at the edge on a fanless PC, right? More cores, more compute power, et cetera, et cetera. So what we did is we brought this edge compute into their place and now suddenly the, all the cameras were super smart. They could do all these analytics and send that data back to their cloud. And that's key, again, not changing the infrastructure too much, but how do you optimize in a scalable way? And maybe another example I can give is, is driver behavior, which is quite important if you have, and, and also anti-theft cameras for trucks and buses. If you're transporting Intel products, because we have a customer that does this, and uh, it's a high value goods. If you're transporting Apple iPhones, that's high value goods. You wanna make sure it's safe. You wanna make sure there's anti-theft, real-time data that you can just uh, you know, track all of the, uh, all over. Uh, so yeah, we have projects with chemical uh, com uh, co companies moving chemicals, high value goods, right? Pharmaceutical companies that you can not only track your assets, but also manage your fleets throughout the journey. Also optimize their, uh, 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 you know, routing, uh, which has been always the case with fleet management, but now they can do this much better because they understand, you know, how to use all the camera and the sensor technology in the vehicles, which again, we didn't change anything. We didn't change the vehicles. We didn't buy new vehicles. We just added sensors and compute to it. Again, an example of not changing your infrastructure, but still being apply, uh, being able to apply the, all those technologies. Um, so those are some, some examples. Yeah. 
No. Thank you, Mac. P Peter, give us another a, a different uh, Intel perspective on this with some studies. Sure. Yeah, I think the, the first thing I would say is obviously the, the big story is there. Uh, we've talked a lot about cameras and stuff like that, but um, behind all of the scenes, uh, where does all this data go and how does it actually get processed? Um, if you can imagine you have your data center somewhere, whether it's in the cloud or maybe you have some data centers yourself trying to run this data, and suddenly you're getting swamped by it. And how does an Intel technology help actually you prevent being overloaded? You know, we have this thing called denial of service where we have foreign, foreign adversaries trying to stop your data center working. Now you're doing it yourself and you were intending to use that data. Now I can imagine a picture is you know a thousand times bigger piece of data than a temperature, for example, simple reading. Um, so what Intel has done is been working around actually on the data center side. How do we speed up the processes? How do you manage to run your workload but faster with what you've got? And we have a technology called Optane, which helps us do that. It's a memory uh, a memory technology and a storage technology. And we've worked with an awful lot of the service providers, so your cloud guy, your AWS, Azure but also you know, in Google as well and, and many others, but also on-prem as well. And we've implemented plans to do that. Um, we've seen certainly in retail business the, with their packaging and online ordering, that has made a major difference to their being able to actually fulfill those orders. Um, and we've all had experience over the last two years of trying to order stuff and, and suddenly finding that we're 99th in the queue for like three hours trying to wait to get our bid on there. A lot of that is not because they don't have the goods, not because they can't load or pack them. You know, there are challenges there as well, but simply there's just too many users at one time trying to get orders online. And that is where we've been working with a lot of the UK uh, retailers. And, and hopefully you've probably seen this, that the processes get better over the last two years. And that is because of some of the technologies that they've been able to deploy there. Um, another one I want to go back to again is, is with the cameras. You know, we're talking about a camera and we've talked about 3D dimensions here. But once you have a picture, you can spring out into all the new business models. You know, is, for example, if I take a picture of Isabel's 3D package, you know, is it, for example, the right way up? What was the barcode or the QR code on it? I could take that, because I've got a picture, I know now. Um, that can come as new data. In the past, somebody would have to hand scan that in, and you know, maybe even with a handheld nowadays. Another one is, has it been damaged? Is that good, it's actually got a dent in it, because it should be square, but it's actually now round, uh, maybe I should push it to one side so it can be inspected offline and not get muddled up with the rest of the loads and delivered badly. So all of these decisions can be made and you can start to actually look at programs, innovation programs within your company to look at this and say, hey, I've got the data. How do I now make more business value out of it? And we have right. some examples of that as well coming through as active projects at the moment. OK, thank you, Peter. Robin, what about Inner Wisdom itself? Some some case study examples. Sure. So yes, yeah, a few examples, and actually just to just to throw in a couple of stats um, first. So I think um, the examples I wanted to pick out, what the areas we're focused in is is really around the the cost and optimization of of stuff in transit, really right through the supply chain. So just a couple of stats. So um, depends on industry sector, of course, but around let's say around thirty nine percent of um, the costs of the of the goods is um, in terms of the the transport logistics costs is is down to transport and and the in terms of the landed cost of goods it can range anywhere from say five to fifty percent of the cost of landed goods is transport right that's why we care so much about the stuff that we're we're talking about so just to bring that now to concrete examples um, so a couple of things to go through one is just around not just around but focusing on essentially uh, the actual optimization of the transport itself. So if we look in the marine sector, so shipping, so shipping goods, say from China to the US or whatever, then the, and especially in the current climate, it's like super, super, it's always been relevant, but it's super, super relevant. I think we might've lost you again, Robin. <laughs> Bluetooth, huh? <laughs> Yeah, we don't do anything with Bluetooth at Intel. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm not sure how it got standardized in the world, but <laughs> well, while we're while we're waiting for Robin, Robin, if you uh, shout, uh, are you back in the room? Okay. Good. I'm sorry, I'll give up on the uh, Jabra speaker. Just a little mention there. So, um, 
Yeah, so on the fuel optimization side, it's such a huge, there's a huge business case essentially on the fuel optimization. Um, so it's it's in the hundreds of thousands of dollars, even for a single voyage. So there's even small tweaks in terms of um, vessel routing or vessel delays or optimization of vessels. So there's a huge, uh, that's a huge area um, where the business case has really come out very large. I just wanted to kind of focus on that on the marine side. And then getting more specific in terms of the actual supply chain optimization. So so-called um, estimated time of arrival or ETA is a, is a really big area. So we've worked on that very strongly. So with a customer in the Middle East called Aramex. So they're a, kind of like a FedEx type organization, huge in the Middle East market. Um, so we've um, there's public case studies on the web if you have a look for those. Um, this, around, this is around the uh, delivery goods right from obviously source to destination across, um, across country boundaries as well. So it's got also kind of the import export element so all these can be modeled using the data collected from the various devices that we've talked about today and the data points in order to optimize and make very solid uh, predictions much more solid predictions of of when goods will be arrived and therefore give a better consumer end experience as well and then building on um building on that point so another customer one of our other customers is that they're the largest um automaker in the world in fact this is in north in north america and so here we're we're modeling, we're modeling essentially the dwell time, if you like, the wait time at each of the warehouses or the various yards as, as the goods go through, um, and also the transit time for uh, shipping and so marine, um, and then trains and, and road, road haulage as well. And then modeling each of those models independently. So like, there's a machine learning model for each of those, which we combine to then produce a, an end-to-end -end prediction of the journey time for a particular shipment plan for some goods. Um, and crucially understand where the variability in the, the kind of if you like the weaknesses are in that um, in that model and just to give some a concrete example so historically I guess organizations have largely done this using sort of statistical modeling of a kind of average performance through the supply chain and we've managed to improve that by 45 percent in terms of the on-day predictability of when goods will finally arrive in a very long supply chain um, so this is a great example of that kind of um, that kind of relentless pressure to improve predictability um, th through their supply chains for the end consumer experience. Um, so I think that's um, that's the, that, those are just a couple of examples of kind of the key areas that we're we're exploiting the data to to get that better uh, business business outcome. Okay, fantastic. Some great examples there. I mean, I do want to get on to, if there's some time at the end, I do want to get on to future trends. But before that, I think it would be good to get into some of the questions. That attendees might be um, will be asking, um, you know, I think one of one of the things that that maybe puts companies off embarking on technology is the fear of disruption, disruption to processes, etc. What would you say to that? I mean, you talked about it, Robin, there about speed speed of implementation. But let me come around to each of you. How long how long does your technology take to implement, and how disruptive is it to existing processes? I mean, let me start with you, Isabel. Sure. So um, I think adoption of technology is definitely the biggest fear for, for customers, as you mentioned there. Um, the, the one thing from our side is we can implement as quickly or as slowly as a com company would like. Um, and I think that's what it comes down to is with the adoption of such innovative technology, it comes down to the culture, culture of the business. It comes down to engagement within the warehouse for us. Um, so we've we've implemented in very quick succession, so a couple of weeks uh, maximum to get people trained up and, and set on their way. Um, but should that need to be longer because you need that period of training, you need that period of culture change, and that's also totally OK. Um, not every business is the same. Um, and, and also it all depends on where they are in their journey of technology. Um, but I think it's worth saying on behalf of everyone, technology is now easily adoptable it is about we've all had to transition in the pandemic world to work remotely so we definitely thrive in that place of we work with global clients and therefore we can implement globally remotely um, and i think that's something that that everyone can take away from technology in general is that adoption is becoming so much easier it's not something to be fearful of um, but it's about engagement and it's about engagement with yourselves, with your employees, with the wider community, so your clients as well, um, to, to make them aware of the changes that you're making as well. So, yeah, that, that's kind of my two pence on adoption for technology. Thanks, Isabel. What, Mac, what, what, what would you add to that? 
Yeah, I think for us as a technology enabler, it's really important as, as you know, Isabel said, make sure all stakeholders are aware and what, how it will disrupt and impact, impact their activities, right? Making sure transparency is very important there right? because everybody needs to have some kind of sense of ownership within transformational change. Because at a certain point, it will hit everybody's activity, right? In some way or form. So be transparent, take stakeholders together. Also be flexible. As I said, customers say, hey, I can't change my infrastructure. How can you help me? That I would always say, you know what? Let's start small, think big, start small, but move fast, right? So we can prove to you how the technology works. So that's how we do it with pilot projects, give it timelines, give, give it KPIs, and then you'll get there, right? But then again, make sure everybody's involved, right? That's 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 another way of, 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 of making sure that the adoption is, is much faster. And also in part of transparency, build a business case, right? Does it make sense for you to have all kinds of camera sensors? Does it make sense for you to have driver behavior monitoring systems or package measurement? Let's do the business case study with your finance team, with everybody else, and see how the, the financial impact of this change will be. I think if you have you know, those elements uh, within uh, you know, the adoption, uh, it, it, will be, it will be very much successful. Because as humans, we've always shown also in the pandemic, we're flexible enough. Once the change is good, we'll just take it and run with it and make, you know, scale it really fast. So um, you know, those are some of the elements I would, I would definitely advise uh, people to use. Thanks, Mac. Peter? Yeah, I mean, I support obviously what, what Mac and Isabel have been saying, but I, I suppose for me, the biggest challenge is be very clear on your business outcome to start with, to understand what you'd be happy with at the other end. Um, don't get in too much of the duts and bolts of how it'll happen initially. When you're planning these things and worrying about the cost, don't just find out for yourself, what do I want to achieve with my business outcome? My, my biggest challenge is, is what I call business creep or function feature creep. So you start out to design one thing and it, it just blossoms out of control. If on the other hand, you actually said, what I want to achieve is all these things, but my initial thing wants to be this. This is the outcome I need from this. And then other projects may follow. I think that's the, the challenge I have with that. So think it out and then let your technology providers like Intel with our partners um, come along and, and, and give you the, the options, the solutions to do that. But you have to be very clear what your business outcome wants to be and a time frame, of course. Sure, thank you for that. Yeah, Robin, I mean, the initial question there was about disruption to processes, but it's coming to a much wider, a, a almost bigger set, a second question, which is, which is what's the advice you would give to, to any company or organization embarking on this process? Um, so maybe you could sort of look at both, look at disruption and then say about advice for how to do it well. Sure, so I think from a, just from a disruption or barriers point of view, um, just listening to my colleagues on the call, I think that um it, it the, the areas we focus on are we're, it's relatively frictionless because what we're doing is we're exploiting data that's already collected so typically so in the example i gave earlier for example of this 45 percent improvement of one day delivery performance um we're using all the existing data that our customer already had access to from their supply chain and sort of instrumentation systems um but that does create so there's no real friction to there's no sort of technology friction in terms of adopting that um particularly and not but not wish not wishing to kind of um, skip over the business adoption of using these these machine learned outputs and the trust in them so I don't want to trivialize that um, the and then that drives I think a, a kind of virtuous circle back to some of the other points that have been made that um, there is still uh, if you like sort of, you know legacy instrumentation and data collection systems that need that it'll take time to gradually collect great data at each point in the supplier distribution chain um, Using this, so the technology is discussed on the call. So that's great, and that, that creates the pressure for that, and the, it justifies the business case for those investments as well in terms of deeper instrumentation or instrumentation on vessels crossing the oceans, for example. Is there's a lot of vessels that still don't capture data very frequently. A lot of them are you know, still based on noonday day reports, for example. So on the, that's on the friction side. In terms of in terms of adoption advice, I think um, Peter made a really good point. So I think that. Um, one of the anti-patterns or challenges really is um, certainly in our data exploitation spaces there's so much to go at right there's um and it's easy to um it's very important to be focused and sort of pick your battles prioritize really carefully so we have a standard opportunity prioritization scoring uh, mechanism that we go through with customers too so like what are the use cases that are really feasible and really going to kind of um, hit the business needle um and also one of the 
trends there is that different department owners have very different lens, look at that through a very different lens, right? So it's it's it, there's a gray scale to that comparison. I think that's really crucial to um, if you like pick battles, do one or two things really well with a tight timeline, as it was also mentioned. Um, so essentially to sort of discover first, invest later is one of our mantras to justify ongoing investment um, before you know before you get to a true business rollout. So I think that's a really key key behavior. Fantastic. Thank you for that. Well, look, we're we're almost at time, but I can't I can't let you go. I cannot let when I, whenever I do a, a technology uh, session of this kind with with you know real free uh, forward thinkers in the world of technology, I have to know what's coming down the track and what we're all going to be thinking about. You know, the, the, the rest of us haven't thought about yet. So I mean, what's coming? In, what new other technology is coming in this space? Just maybe a, a minute or so each on this, if you wouldn't mind. Let, let me let me start with you, Mac. I know you've you've got something to say about digital twinning. Yes, absolutely. So, I mean, I, I know it's probably a buzzword by by now these days, you know, digital twinning, but I've heard many, you know, elements of AI in this in this uh, discussion, for example, machine learning, deep learning, this is all under the umbrella of AI. If you want to make machine learning much better, which is like our own brains, right? You, we have the eyes already, we already have the brains, brains you know and then all of the networks that we connect together it's software defined so we can just you know put that all together what machine learning needs just like ourselves when we were born like babies is data we learn more we adapt we learn more we adapt we learn more and so if you want to optimize your machine learning algorithms in your cloud or in your data center you need data the more data you give it the better predictions machine learning will make for you if you have it all in a digital twin, meaning that you have a real-time data feeding back to your machine every, each time, every minute, every second, it knows where your fleets are, your assets, how your uh, warehouse is, is operating constantly, all the time. That data is fed into a machine learning system. At a certain point in 10 years, the, all that data that's gathered will make you much more resilient in any kind of a chaos or, you know, Things will happen more, right? Pandemics will come, wars will come, everything will come, but your machine learning algorithms can help you adapt much better than we have now. But in order to get there, you need to be able to capture that data at the edge, real time, where the action happens. At the Thank same you. time, also in the network, and then all the way back to the cloud. And this is how I see the future of the digital twin. Before that, bef not get capturing that data at the edge or in the network, you know, it will not happen. So I think you know, invest in that in that capturing all that data that you're you're uh, you're having in your processes. Thanks, thanks for that, Mac. Um, maybe a theme for another webinar there. But I mean, just very briefly, then quick, very quick point each, because we're in, almost at time now. So Isabel. Yeah. So I think you know, I'd echo everything Mac said there about digital twin. I think the one main thing is is getting to that real time space. So it's all about the data. How quickly can you receive it and therefore how can that data then knock on the impacts of your business so the agility the responsiveness the proactiveness from a technology ai space that can enable your business thanks isabel peter in a word autonomy so we've now got the data now we're automating now we're making decisions the decisions have to be made so much faster now because we've got so much more data we're going to have to autonomize some of those decisions we're going to have to leave the machine to make some basic decisions for us. And I think that's the next thing. Yeah, a little bit scary for me, because I started out in this revolution sort of, what, 40 years ago, and never thought it would get this far um, and this fast. And it's just around the corner, corner autonomy. So that'll be the next thing to hit you. And basically now I've got all this data and now I can make decisions. I can't make them fast enough myself with my employees. I'm gonna have to let some of that be made autonomously. Thanks, Peter. And the last word for you, Robin. Thanks. Uh, yeah, just building on the points just made, I think the um, I'm actually most excited about the next few years rather than sort of slightly further out. I think that um, kind of table stakes for most organisations now is just understanding when goods will arrive, understanding their supply and distribution networks, um, and almost like you know what will happen tomorrow. And there's less focus, although we now have the technology, or it's you know on the cusp of it. When um, there's less focus at the moment on those what if scenarios, what will I do if my supply chain is disrupted in this way and this way? How do I how do I respond to say sudden dis supply and demand side interruptions and changes like COVID and so on? So I think it's 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 that what if modeling and using that digital twin that we now have. We have the models that we have the capability now to to take a more proactive view about how to optimize our supply chains and make them more resilient 
um, and more prescriptive analytics rather than just predictive. That's that's the next step on the road for most organisations, I feel, and that's a that's a here and now opportunity. Sure, very exciting. Well, we're, we've reached the end of our session. Um, thanks so much to, to everyone. Thanks to you for watching. Um, if you do have further questions, please do uh, get in touch and our panellists will endeavour to answer those. Um, the place to do that would be with Inner Wisdom themselves. The email would be info at innerwisdom.com, info at innerwisdom.com. Um, just also to clarify that you, you will receive the recording to listen again if you so wish and you will be able to share it as well uh, and also an email with details of where to get more information on what's being discussed today. So on that note, thanks to you for attending and thanks especially to all of our panellists, Mac, uh, Isabel, Robin and Peter. Um, I look forward to doing this again with you one day but uh, for now, thanks very much and goodbye. Thank you. Bye. Bye.